Welcome to the Cities of Migration Learning Exchange. Today's session brings you perspectives on Canada's immigrant future, a new project at Cities of Migration that explores the challenges and opportunities of immigration in our smaller cities, towns, and regions. The Immigrant Futures webinar series is presented in partnership with the Hamilton Economic Development, the City of Moncton, the Halifax Partnership, Leeds Grenville Local Immigration Partnership, and Hire Immigrants Magnet, with funding support from Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Today's webinar, Inroads to Entrepreneurship, Local Strategies to Support Immigrant Business and Local Prosperity. Immigrants face the same challenges in starting a new business as entrepreneurs anywhere. Additional roadblocks can include language, limited knowledge of local markets, regulatory issues, access to credit, or vital business networks. What can smaller cities do to support aspiring immigrant entrepreneurs and ensure that they lay down the roots for a successful business and a happy life in their new home and community? Today we'll hear how community initiatives in the cities of Fredericton, New Brunswick and Peterborough, Ontario are providing inroads to entrepreneurism and economic inclusion for newcomers. We are joined today by Janet Moser, who is Managing Director, Immigration Services with Ignite uh, Fredericton, and by Reem Ali, Community Development Worker with the New Canadian Centre Peterborough. Uh, and I'm delighted now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Janet Moser. Janet is Managing Director of Immigration Services at Ignite Fredericton, the city's community economic development agency. With over 30 years professional experience ranging widely from business owner to career counselor, for the past 10 years Janet's focus has been the creation and management of immigrant and entrepreneurial settlement programming. As connector, negotiator, liaison and advocate, Janet has worked tirelessly between government and private industry to support business development and startup success for immigrant investors in Fredericton and across New Brunswick. Today she is overseeing the build of Fredericton's dynamic five-year immigration and population growth strategy as well as leading the city's local immigration partnership. Welcome Janet, the podium is yours. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here today. So for those of you that um, are not familiar with Fredericton, I, I will give you a quick overview of our, our beautiful city. So Fredericton is the capital of the province of New Brunswick and is located along the banks of the beautiful St. John River on the east coast of Canada. We are one of the four uh, Atlantic provinces that make up what we call the Maritimes. The population of Fredericton is just over 58,000 and I think it's just shy more of that, so we're, we're right around 60,000 at this point. And Fredericton, uh, notably, is the home up to the University of New Brunswick, a premier university and the oldest English-speaking university in Canada. New Brunswick also has uh, a distinct disadvantage at this time to be the oldest population of any other province in Canada. In 2017, New Brunswick was the first province also in Canada to register more deaths than births. So we are in a very critical population decline and immigration is perhaps not the only solution but definitely one of our key solutions in increasing our population. I like to say that we need newcomers here in our region more than they need to be here in Fredericton but we hope that they would take a look at our, our province and our, and our city and choose it as their new home. So we um, have been what I would like to call pioneers uh, for the last number of years, 10 years in fact, uh, almost 11 now going into, uh, with business entrepreneurial programs specific to newcomers. So in, in 2009, the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce approached the provincial government of, of New Brunswick with concerns related to the struggles immigrants uh, business owners were having settling into our community and equally finding a footing to launch a business under the provincial nominee program. 
under the entrepreneurial stream and its terms of agreement. So in answer to that, um, a policy, our policy director wrote a, a program, a pilot, which we launched in May uh, 2009. Uh, after doing an environmental scan across Canada, we recognized that we were definitely forging into unknown territory and would be basically relying on ourselves to build the model and the content of the Business Immigrant Mentorship Program. We then, and still do, see ourselves as pioneers in this space. Since 2009, we've grown, we've adapted, we've pivoted, we've reinvented, and we've doubled down on best practices based on direct feedback from our client mentees. We feel our program is as relevant today and if not more so than it was in 2009. Our program won Best Mentoring Award, which was offered by Startup Canada in their inaugural year in 2012. And in 2014, our program shared first place alongside the cities of Dallas, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts for the Chambers of Commerce um, a designation for innovative community impact projects. And I think it's important to note that this was not um, directly related to immigrant uh, service programs. It was community related in general. So we're very, very proud of that uh, recognition. And I will say that although we are very proud of, of the awards and the accolades that we've gotten over the years, our best success and our greatest pride has been in our newcomers' successes. The Business Immigrant Mentorship Program, as I said, has gone, undergone many transformations over the years. Initially, the program matched, specifically matched chamber member professionals with entrepreneurial newcomers coming in to the province under the Provincial Nominee Program, or PNP. Mentees and mentors were expected to meet no less than 20 hours over a, fun, five, 20 hours over a five month matching period. Going into year two, we added a training component with classroom instruction delivered by our local economic development agency. We ran each year two cohorts. Since 2009, we have completed over 20 cohorts and registered over 250 mentees into the program. Mentees were given a student manual entitled Doing Business in New Brunswick and learn the basics of the Canadian business systems, business etiquette, and basic essentials starting with their naming of a business, registering a business, uh, accounting basics, Canadian banking basics, and um, Canada banking, accounting, and other areas of business that are crucial for a startup. We taught them about Revenue Canada, about workplace safety, and social media how to create a Canadian standard business and marketing plan. In year four, we moved away from the original one-on-one -on -one mentorship model and moved more into a group mentoring format. The reason for this was mentor fatigue and the difficulties we were experiencing in finding mentors who found themselves challenged with language and cultural barriers. Having group mentoring allowed our mentors and our mentees to have a broader range of professional support and, and coaching than we did simply with the one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, from the first years. Each cohort was launched and still is and began with a one-day orientation session and ended with a completion event where mentees were given certificates of completion presented by our city's mayor, uh, government officials, and as we celebrated the success of our mentees, we wanted to definitely give them a great send-off from our programs. And although they complete the programs with us, we remain in very close touch with them and offer them as much support and, and, um, and referral and any type of aid that we can over the, over the first few years of uh, getting their businesses up and operational. Interesting, in 2018, we invited 22 refugees, um, 
most notably a um, majority of them were the Syrian refugees, into our cohort as a pilot offered by IRCC. We recreated our, our program's training manuals and had, it, uh, trans had the training manuals and um, materials um, translated into Arabic and Swahili and had translators in the room to support um, this new cohort. It was, a, it was a wonderful experience, and I know that um, we certainly look forward to the successes. And as we know, as Canadians, refugees have a very good success rate in launching business slowly, but being very successful over their period of time um, or into their initial startup phase and, and past that. So we do charge uh, for the program. Um, we, weren't, we didn't have a fee structure in place the first few years, but we recognized that having a, an added small value, uh, the value added by charging increased, um, I guess, the expectation on our end and, of course, um, contributed to the, the overall cost of, of running such a program. So we charge $250 per cohort. Uh, which is minimal in relation to what our clients receive. Um, but we think it's a goodwill gesture for our funders and for us to be able to have some sustainability and um, generate uh, the income that we feel is, is necessary and, and in keeping with our, our funders and, um, and, and you know, having that opportunity to show the goodwill. Uh, the success of this program is measured by many variables, most notably a successful business startup, job creation, and the retention of our newcomers. The other benefits are many as well, developing a, a local network within the business community for our newcomers, learning the culture of doing business in Canada, and learning how Canadians think, how we spend, what we consume. This program breaks down many barriers and roadblocks and offers ease of passage for the entrepreneurial journey of a newcomer entrepreneur. The Hive program was first launched in uh, 2013 by our sister city of Moncton. Uh, La Rouche, as it was known then, was offered in French, as Moncton has a larger, much larger population of a percentage of French-speaking immigrants coming into the region. New Brunswick is the only official bilingual province, and therefore there is a great emphasis placed on increasing our French-speaking immigration numbers to maintain a healthy percentage of French residents. In 2014, the Hive, as we say it in English, was launched here in Fredericton, and if you see on your screen, that is an image of our space. Operational since 2014, it's a dedicated space for entrepreneurial startup for newcomers. Uh, our clients can access the space 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they are key holders. We offer them administrative support, Wi-Fi, printer usage, all get a complimentary Chamber of Commerce membership, and they have access to us um, and our team daily. They get also a business address and a business mailbox. They are all required to term, uh, sign uh, terms of agreement. And this space that we offer them is in a prime rental retail um, area of the city. We also offer them free attendance to major business events and conferences. We require monthly check-ins with, with the program director and have eight spaces available at a cost of $275 a month, all-inclusive. We feel that this is an excellent opportunity for newcomer entrepreneurs to have that first Canadian business experience with a soft landing into uh, a business environment and out of the silo of trying to do this in their own home. We have very high retention numbers for our Hive members, which we're very proud of. Funded fully by the government of New Brunswick, but also, as I mentioned previously, we do uh, bring in revenues as well from sponsors and, and client registrations, which does aid to our budget. 
Uh, the Hive has taken a life of its own. It became the hub of the immigrant business community, and from, from it, we launched one of our most attended programs, which we have named Coffee Chat. Coffee Chat was designed to bring local business owners and immigrant owners together in an informally weekly Friday morning event. And each Coffee Chat was themed, uh, was themed, and each participant was free to share their ideas, their concerns, uh, their business um, thoughts, and to learn about the culture of doing business uh, with us here in Fredericton. It's a very lively and interesting opportunity for our newcomers to, to take part in. We call it our home. This is the home of the business entrepreneur, the newcomer business entrepreneur, and they are so proud to invite the local business community into it. Named as the top 10 innovator of programming directly impacts entrepreneurs by the Conference Board of Canada. Again, the Hive has proven to be uh, a leader uh, and pioneer across Canada. We also won recognition in 2015 with the Government of the United States under President Obama's Immigrant Entrepreneurial Task Force as we were invited to share our experiences and best practices in Dallas, Texas. So this slide here just gives you an overview of everything I, I just went through, and I'm, I apologize, I, I forgot to uh, click the arrow. So now I'm going to take you into the next slide, which is our third program, Succession Connect. Succession Connect was our second, uh, our Fredericton's second innovative pilot launch, again, a first in Canada. And we know this because we have done environmental scans, um, so we are very proud of that funded by the Government of Canada under the Atlantic Canadian Opportunities Agency, the Government of New Brunswick under Post-Secondary Education Training and Labour, and the City of Fredericton, as well as three major corporate sponsors, we were able to launch this new program in 2016. With a three-year pilot and um, the objectives, were to prepare newcomer entrepreneurs and how to successfully purchase a turnkey business opportunity here in our region. One of the mandates of our program as given to us by our funders was to develop a, a handoff tool or a toolkit, if you will, once we completed our, our three-year pilot. Um, and we've done that very successfully. Um, as you'll see here on the screen, we have a, a brilliant uh, guide for newcomers entitled Building Wealth, the Newcomer's Guide, How to Buy Business in New Brunswick. Along with that guide, we have, and I should mention that the guide was written by um, a local uh, professional writer, and I'm very happy to say that uh, it's, uh, again, it, it's a magnificent piece of work. And we've also hired and or had uh, developed a professional curriculum and training component that goes with this, uh, with this uh, guide. So, Succession Connect. We call it our big onion. <laughs> what a, a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful program. Uh, it's given us a lot of challenges, and we have, have identified many opportunities as well. Um, the challenges that we um, faced um, have been, of course, businesses not wanting to publicly advertise their business for sale. Small business owners, particularly of those uh, with less than 10 employees, do not have a succession uh, plan in place, and most notably, uh, an inaccurate assessment of the value of their holdings which makes it difficult to really identify um, true market value. Um, there's often a skills and experience mismatch between immigrant investors and small to medium enterprise owners. The regulatory challenges that we faced with the provincial nominee program requirements um, uh, inadvertently have desensitized local uh, business from selling to immigrant investors. The cultural challenge, we're a very small, tightly knit uh, community and the business networks are, are small as well. We don't always know how to say welcome as well as we should. 
liabilities, um, educating that we're not a business brokerage or agency, and identifying that we, we were and were not um, ever to be such. Um, many opportunities, uh, we have the completion on, of, the, of the toolkit, um, and we've identified that uh, a succession planning as such is not an immigration issue. And, we sh and should be handled from an economic development agency with services with one-on-one -on -one support of business succession planning services. Personalized, Im immig um, personalized immigrant entrepreneur investor attraction and retention is something that we really need to focus on here in New Brunswick in order to best match local business opportunities with newcomers coming in. Um, the opportunities also uh, would be leadership and knowledge from that, uh, that transfer exchange and we really uh, were encouraging the business owners to allow the newcomer business owner to stay and, and work with them um, as they went through the purchase and sales agreements period. So with this Succession Connect, we again have built a wonderful program out. We're, we're very happy to share it but we also have learned a great deal over the three years and, and that's what uh, running a pilot is all about, is, is, is learning from, from trial and error and, and taking the best and moving forward with it. So our city has undergone some changes in terms of um, the location of the, the three immigrant uh, business programs and in this just Last year in 2019, we launched a very robust immigration strategy for our, our city. The idea behind the new strategy was to streamline service provision. We're cutting out any overlap or redundancy. We have created what we feel is the one-stop shop that newcomers have been looking for. We took the entrepreneurial program out of the home uh, of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce and we relocated them within the economic development arm of the City of Fredericton with Ignite Fredericton. That has freed up the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce to become the advocacy uh, voice of business for newcomers in our region and uh, we're very happy about that. And as well, they have created um, uh, a business immigrant um, uh, advocacy committee. And this, then, of course, the settlement piece is directly located with our multicultural association. All immigration and population growth activities are now directed under the umbrella of the Local Immigration Partnership, which is a federally funded national program. My role has changed as well, and I now am the managing director of the immigration services for the city and for um, um, Ignite Fredericton. So with the, with the change and the growth, uh, I mentioned the programs are now located uh, in the sister organization of Ignite Fredericton with Planet Hatch. Originally, the Hive, um, prior to the move, was located um, next to, adjacent to Planet Hatch. So they've just, um, they've, they've changed uh, directors, but they're still basically in the, in the same space. But the program itself has taken on a whole new light, and I'm very thrilled that um, they've gone from um, myself and, and one staff to being able to offer five um, professionals to, to advance these programs. So I, I'm very, very excited about that. I feel like I've handed off uh, my child and it's now in university. So the growth and the expansion of the entrepreneurial business programs, so you can read here, the mission is to help uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups and grow. And Planet Hatch is a, a large entrepreneurial startup space, uh, one of the largest in Atlantic Canada. So our newcomers are now completely integrated into the business development uh, uh, space here in Fredericton. So some of the advancing objectives is to increase uh, the client success and the economic impact for our newcomers. Uh, we're reducing, again, the duplication and redundancy and to develop a robust model for success. So you'll see here the increased assets for the Hive and the BIMP clients now that we've made the move. 
Um, so we're very, very pleased that we know that we can build on on, on the foundational success uh, uh, of the, the program and to take it into, into the next five years and beyond. So I, I know I was cognizant of the time. I went over a little bit, but I, I just really wanted to give you a good overview of who we are here in Fredericton and, and what we've done. It hasn't all been easy, but I can tell you it's certainly been um, a wonderful experience. And, and we are a city of, of sharing, so if, uh, if there's anything that we can do beyond um, this presentation, we're more than happy to do it. My contact information is here. And, and I'll pass it back over. And thank you very much for the opportunity today. Well, oh, thank you, Janet. That was a brilliant presentation. What a lot of work. Thank you so much for sharing uh, how this work is making Fredericton really a launch pad uh, and business incubator to support immigrant entrepreneurs. And, and I think very important takeaway, uh, also a robust, well-tested model that other cities across Canada can certainly um, uh, take advantage of. Thank you so much. So now from Fredericton to Peterborough, I'm delighted to introduce Re Ali. Reem is the community development worker at the New Canadian Centre Peterborough and the project lead there on the economic and social empowerment of newcomers. Reem also coordinates working groups under the Peterborough Local Immigration Partnership um, with its focus on refugee and immigrant integration. Reem has a, an MSc in biochemistry from McMaster and a master's in public administration from Carleton University. But it was a passion for international development that led her to Egypt, where she spent six years specializing in the field of child rights, working with local and international organizations, big ones like CETA, UNICEF, and the Drossos Foundation. Reem continues to teach at Trent University um, in the International Development Studies Department. In 2018, Reem's leadership uh, was recognized by two prestigious awards. Uh, she was one of the city's four under 40, awarded by the uh, Greater Peterborough Chamber of Commerce. Also in 2018, Reem was recipient of the inaugural Peterborough Kortha Women's Leadership Award. Bravo to you. And welcome, Reem. The podium is yours. Thank you so much, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Cities of Migration for this opportunity. Today I will be presenting on programming that empowers newcomer women who face barriers to traditional pathways to employment. And specifically, I will be presenting on a project that is very dear to my heart, that being Newcomer's Kitchen, Peterborough. But first, just for those of you joining us outside of Peterborough, some information about our city. Peterborough, Ontario is situated in central Ontario within the Kawartha Lakes region. Uh, the so-called gateway to cottage country. We are about an hour and a half drive uh, from Toronto, three hours from Ottawa. Our city's population is just over 82,000 with 88% white, 6% Aboriginal and 6% visible minority. The median age in Peterborough City is about 47. Um, however, we do have one of Canada's largest ratio of seniors. Uh, on the flip side of that, we do have a growing population of young professionals and a very large student population thanks to Trent University and Fleming College. And both Trent and Fleming serve uh, as uh, two of the large employers here in the city, in addition to many small businesses, all providing services in various sectors. The new Canadian Centre Peterborough, the MCC, is a non-for-profit charitable organization that is dedicated to supporting immigrants, refugees, and other newcomers in the Peterborough and Northumberland regions. Our mission at the NCC is to empower immigrants and refugees to become full and equal members of Canadian society and to provide community leadership to ensure cultural integration in a welcoming community. Through the services that I have listed on the slide, our goal is to build capacity and make connections between individuals and the community. And this year, we are celebrating 40 years of our work with the theme, We Belong. During our 2018-2019 fiscal year, we served close to 700 new clients from 103 countries. 
And because our presentation today focuses on a project that supported the training of Syrian newcomers, I will also note that since 2016, we have supported around 74 Syrian families who arrived in Peterborough as government-assisted refugees. Along with the privately sponsored Syrian refugees, that means over 500 individuals have received some kind of support through our center. The NCC is also host to the Peterborough Immigration Partnership, or PIP, which was established in 2008. And it is essentially a community-based partnership of individuals and organizations, including the NCC. With the support of the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration, PIP engages with community partners and individuals to coordinate and improve service delivery for newcomers and refugees, and to improve organizational capacity to work with these client groups. Through these relationships, we are able to design training programs that seek to enhance the settlement and employment supports available to vulnerable newcomers in order to facilitate their social and economic integration. And one such program is Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough. Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough started as a business model based on Newcomer's Kitchen Toronto. The goal of which was to bring newcomers together to cook weekly meals in a community kitchen, sell the meals, and share the proceeds among the cooks. Our initial attempt at supporting a model that was based on the Toronto project immediately exposed many challenges. It became clear that the participating women had some conflicts to sort through. They also needed guidance in terms of how their group was going to transition into a food business. They struggled to work or think as a team, and their motivation and confidence were severely lacking. So we decided to take a step back from the business model and explore the women's desires for joining this project, essentially to give them some agency to help direct the project's flow. They needed the technical know-how regarding the Canadian food business, but most importantly, we felt that they needed to discover how and why they must work as a team. So the NCC officially engaged the Nourish Project as a project partner to develop a work plan that caters to the needs of the project participants. The implementation was led by myself as well as Chef Amanda Harrison, food facilitator at the Nourish Project. The plan itself was divided into short training cycles that focused on specific topics for building the participants' capacity in the kitchen. Moreover, these training topics developed organically, as needed by the participants. Their progress was monitored and evaluated throughout each training cycle, and the new needs arising shaped the next training cycle. The Nourish Project was a suitable partner because they are mandated to work with vulnerable individuals in the Peterborough community in order to provide them with knowledge to enhance their food security. Having a co-facilitator like Amanda was important in several ways. Her knowledge of the kitchen and her experience in culinary management was the reason most obvious. However, it was her facilitation skills and her community development background that helped deliver the trainings to the women in a way that was accepted and welcomed by them. It was also important that I, as a project lead, also shared a similar background, and this proved to be an asset for building a close relationship with the women, helping them move the project forward. So here I have a quick summary of the technical skills training modules that were delivered, and I will just briefly talk about each one of them because I think it's important for everyone to see how much effort went into planning, implementing, and debriefing each of these modules. So Nourish Training Phase 1 um, essentially focused on learning about the different food business models that are available and meeting some successful and local women business owners from the Peterborough community. Nourish Training Phase 2 focused on recipe development and product consistency, safe food handling and best kitchen practices, conflict resolution and group decision processes, commitment to the group, and English as a second language. And this particular training series also involved a lot of self and group reflections and evaluations and included class time as well as hands-on kitchen experience. The numeracy training helped the participants build their numeracy skills and learn the difference between metric and imperial measures and weights and volumes. 
They were also able to practice using measuring cups and spoons and translate fractions into numbers in order to multiply and divide recipes. During the nutrition, nutrition training supported by Peterborough Public Health, um, the participants were able to understand and improve the nutritious value of their existing recipes and apply this to their future recipe development. The sessions also focused on using local seasonal produce, understanding the Canada Food Guide, creating gluten-free and low-fat recipes, as well as reading food labels. The business integrated part of the training focused on uh, sessions um, that dealt with budgeting and pricing, wholesale purchases, receiving and delivering orders, as well as marketing and promotion. And at the end of this particular module, the group applied their learnings through two main events. The first was receiving and delivering lunch orders to Peterborough Public Health staff. And the second was serving as a food vendor at Peterborough's second annual vegan festival. Following these training modules, the group decided to take on small catering jobs to further test their abilities with receiving and delivering orders. However, catering was introducing too much pressure at the early stages of the business startup. We therefore decided that it would be best for them instead to become a vendor at the Peterborough Regional Farmers Market. This was a good opportunity for the group to try something that helped them create a routine for themselves, which in turn expanded their learning and training. Here I have a list of some of our key partners in this project, but as you read this list, I'd like to highlight the advantages of being immersed in a weekly market setting. So being at the market for the women uh, provided them with a fixed schedule a fixed date, time, and place to sell their meals, a fixed venue with a relatively stable flow of customers, and a safe, friendly, and low-pressure environment. This meant that they were surrounded by other vendors who were welcoming and supportive. It was a place where these newcomer women felt like they belonged, where the market became an extension to their existing community. The New Canadian Centre and the Nourish Project at this point became available for support only when needed, but the majority of the work was the sole responsibility of Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough. It is also important to highlight the role of the Jewish Community Centre in the business phase of this project. They were a supportive partner throughout the process, providing free kitchen space for the group's work, particularly following their completion of the business integrated training cycle. Of course, the women went through several challenges and barriers, some of which are similar to challenges that may be experienced in similar projects. The most important challenge uh, that I will emphasize here is the challenge associated with growth limitations. Within the context of clients who are on social assistance, receiving compensation for their work was subjected to deductions and this eventually became one of the discouraging factors for the women's participation in the project. Participatory community development was essential not only for the success of the project, but also for enabling the participants with agency and ownership when it came to decision making. Asking them what they wanted to learn about and what to do next ensured their attendance, their interest, and their participation. Their commitment to launching their business was a direct result of this. They were proud of how much work they had to put into the trainings because it was difficult at times and required much patience on their part as well as extra support from their families. They didn't want to throw any of that away. They owned this because they knew how much they had to do in order to get to where they were. In its last stages, Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough consisted of four newcomer Syrian women, down from the group of 16 that we started with. These women were very close with one another, having endured a lot together. The model that we chose for this project may have been different than Toronto's, but these women developed the capacity to do the work on their own, with minimal guidance. Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough became owned and run by the newcomer women. This project served as a successful model and pilot for future projects involving programming for newcomer women. The journey through this project provided participants with the technical knowledge needed to run a food business, 
as well as provided us and our partners with a better understanding of what is required to run successful programming for newcomer women. It offered us a glimpse into their lives and the challenges that they face. Most importantly, it allowed them to become more confident as individuals and more resilient as a group. The partnership with the Nourish Project as well as the Jewish Community Center contributed heavily to the success of this project and moving forward provides a model for what similar community partnerships are capable of. With that, I would like to thank our funders here at the NCC for this project, the Luke Four Foundation and the Newcomer Settlement Program, and I will end where I started with the theme of empowerment by quoting Toni Morrison. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. And I think that's what we try to do with this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Reem, for, for sharing the, newcomer, the Newcomer's Kitchen Peterborough, uh, how it empowers refugee women through that uh, uh, cooking magic, but how it reaches so far beyond um, the kitchen. Uh, thank you so much. Economic inclusion really uh, does benefit uh, everyone. So let's move now. Thank you, Janet Moser and Reem Ali, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. We've now concluded the formal portion of today's webinar, and it's time uh, to shift to our audience and uh, their questions. Um, before we, uh, so do please continue to submit questions into the Q&A box, and I'll get started with uh, with a couple of questions. So you know, as we've heard, cities across Canada are competing globally now to attract newcomers to start or take over small businesses uh, to create jobs and to build the local economy. Uh, cities are, are also starting to shift this conversation um, away from why they, why they want or need immigrant entrepreneurs and, and how to attract them to really how to design services that can actually support their long-term integration and, and business success. Um, you know, we've, we've come a long way from um, the kind of conversation about business immigration that fixates on the myth of this imaginary investor class that uh, breezes through all the red tape with buckets of money and no challenges. What we know and what we've heard is that rea in reality most entrepreneurs, whether they're immigrants or not, are running small businesses, main street businesses on very lean margins. Um, and of course nowhere is this more important than in Canada's demographically challenged smaller communities. So um, you know, let's pause for a moment to uh, to 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 ask each Janet and Reem for um, reflecting on that. Maybe what what would be the most important piece of advice uh, that you could give an entrepreneurial newcomer um, about starting businesses in our smaller and regional cities, based on on your experience? And maybe we could start with you, Janet. Well, uh, for 10 years I ran a business myself, and I was quite young when I started my business. I was only 26 years old, and I had two small children at home. And I would say the same thing that my parents said to me, are you really sure you want to do this, and do you understand that there's a lot more involved than than what you think? And, and that's absolutely true. And, and what I would say to any newcomer um, entrepreneur is make sure you do your research understand the market that you're going into and understand that, that you're no longer in perhaps the, the type of environment or the culture that you may have done business in prior to. The other piece of advice I would give is that running a business, or I'm sorry, working in a business as a business manager does not reflect on the, on, on the skills and understanding that you need to have as a business entrepreneur. So I would say take as much advice as you can Rely on the professionals in the community that you're in. They understand the business culture here in Canada. They understand systems. And to make sure that you don't do it on your own, that you use the best practices of the local business community. Very good advice. Very good. And, and, for, and over to you, um, Reem, in your experience, what, what is uh, the most important piece of advice you'd give uh, an, an entrepreneur uh, immigrant newcomer with a with a great business idea. So I would um, say that it's very important to manage expectations and to to start with realistic expectations of what is 
uh, contextually and locally possible or even relevant. Um, of course, this in addition to trying to understand the market, to identify the gaps, um, to realize what's in their capacity to offer that is new and unique to um, the context that they're in. Um, and also, of course, to develop a better understanding of the resources and the networks and the support that's around them. Uh, starting small, I would say, is key. So, you know, sometimes we, we have clients that come with very big ideas and perhaps they don't really realize how much it's going to take to actually um, implement such large ideas. And I think that starting small is very important. Um, it's partly what we did with the Newcomer Kitchen Project. Um, the women always had really, really big ideas that they wanted to immediately put um, uh, into implementation. And we had to pull them back and just say, let's just work with one or two goals. So I think starting small in business and building your way up um, as you develop a better understanding of your community is important. Um, and I will just finally add that language is um, key when you are running a business. And if, if these clients feel that their language is their English language or French, um, the, the depending on their context, if that's weak, um, I would say that that should be the number one priority for them to work on that so that they're able to better understand the context that they're in. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, and and uh, my next question really, as we've heard, entrepreneurial activity isn't always about new businesses. Um, more more and some newcomers maybe will, will be taking over the thousands of baby boomer business owners who um, are now retiring and want to sell their 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 stores, their factories, um, the services they've been running, so that they can retire. So we did talk a little bit, Janet, uh, about small business succession planning. Um, uh, I, I would like to tease out a little bit more about um, um, how, how you were able to um, raise this as an important issue for your community and, and initiate the kind of uh, uh, collaboration of the business community uh, around this uh, succession planning with newcomers. And uh, I'd like to add, Janet, that I'd like to ask you that, but I'd also like uh, uh, to hear from Reem about um, the challenges of uh, succession planning in Peterborough. So, but maybe we can start it with you, Janet. Certainly. Thank you. Um, I, I will be very honest with you. The idea of creating a succession pilot um, came to me from my own family. Um, my father's been in business in the city, or had been, um, since he passed away for almost 45 years. And my elder siblings uh, were then running the business, and they were getting well past retirement age and, and looking to try and find a, a buyer. Um, and when you own a business, you, you take that business very personally. You, you've created it, you've, you've, you've nurtured it along, and you just don't want to hand it off to just anybody, and you certainly don't want the alternative, which is to sell off the assets and close the doors and walk away, especially when you have employees that have been with you for a number of years. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of variables around the emotional um, piece for any um, business owner when, when preparing to sell or pass over their business. So watching that, I, I uh, talked to uh, friends and I said, what is out there and available for succession? And I, I quickly learned that there, there wasn't a lot. So I thought, you know what, I, we can do this. We can match immigrant entrepreneurs with local businesses, um, make the initial match, um, make sure that they are well protected, um, and signing off on the fact that our um, Succession Connect uh, mentees, so our newcomers, were working with professional accountants and, and bankers and lawyers to make sure that their best interests were being looked after. So it, there is definitely a need. Um, New Brunswick right now is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the oldest demographic in the country. Um, the the medium age or the, the, the average age of the business owner in New Brunswick is over 55 years old. And so we're, we're going into a critical and are in a critical phase right now with the baby boomers uh, retiring. And the small and medium enterprise are also, they're the foundational structure for our province. Um, you know, we, we do have the large industry, but it's small businesses that, that make up our, our economy. 
so uh, the pilot was um, it, the, the idea behind the pilot was 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 great, but I will say honestly that we learned so much uh, through the process. Uh, it was just a tremendous uh, learning opportunity. That should we do it again, and, and knowing best practice now, we would certainly have um, have moved things around and 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 taken a different approach at the beginning. But again, as I said, a pilot is just that. It's 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 a proper means to to identify. A, a problem and put some uh, workable solutions in play and, and we think at this point if another region or another city were to launch a program like this uh, we would certainly be more than happy to to share with them uh, the do's and the don'ts in getting something like this up and running. Well, thank you very much. In fact, we have a number of people online asking for precisely more input on that on that replication piece. But uh, let, let's ask also, let's turn to Reem Ali as well um, for her experience uh, in Peterborough and, and the challenges of um, meeting uh, those, the, the needs of those Main Street businesses as their owners um, start to retire, their, their importance to the local economy and, and how um, new Newcomer uh, can fit into that space. What, what, what was your experience in Peterborough? Um, my experience has been directly with um, smaller business startups as opposed to business succession planning, mm -hmm. um, at least for the time being. Um, I'm finding that most of the clients that at least I work with, uh, for them it's not so possible to to enter a model for business succession planning, but instead it's more about um, looking into what is new, uh, what is unique for them to provide as a service um, in our community. And in fact, our local economic development um, organization also encourages that and encourages um, newcomers to start something new and unique, um, offer something that's not being offered um, in the community because it is such a small community. Um, having said that, um, you know, for a newcomer to buy out an existing business would mean that they would need the know-how, the previous know-how, or perhaps even a little bit of the history um, around the business that they are going to buy out or take over. Um, and that, I see that as potentially being um, a little trickier, um, but it's definitely worth uh, looking into as we move forward with our employment plan. Um, for now, and particularly with the work that I do um, with newcomer women, it's about focusing on the skills that they have, that they own, uh, what they see as assets, um, and also trying to push them into work that um, is within a collective, just because it's a more supportive model for, uh, for them and uh, for overcoming the challenges and the barriers that they face um, here in Peterborough. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. So I'm going to move now to some questions from our from our audience, because uh, as time starts to run out, I have uh, one audience member asking about uh, about BIMP in in Fredericton, uh, which and uh, they ask, how do you identify mentors to participate in the program um, without uh, conflict of interest? And I think that's a small community. Um, having said that, um, you know, for a newcomer to buy out an existing business would mean that they would need the know-how, the previous know-how, or perhaps even a little bit of the history um, around the business that they are going to buy out or take over. Um, and that, I see that as potentially being um, a little trickier, um, but it's definitely worth uh, looking into as we move forward with our employment plan. Um, for now, and particularly with the work that I do um, with newcomer women, it's about focusing on the skills that they have, that they own, uh, what they see as assets, um, and also trying to push them into work that um, is within a collective, just because it's a more supportive model for, uh, for them and uh, for overcoming the challenges and the barriers that they face um, here in Peterborough. Okay. Well, thank you. So I'm going to move now to some questions from our from our audience, because uh, as time starts to run out, I have uh, one audience member asking about uh, about BIMP in in Fredericton. Uh, 
which and uh, they ask, how do you identify mentors to participate in the program um, without uh, conflict of interest? And I think that's a larger question. I mean, that one's very specific to uh, business interests, but, but I think the challenge, how do you engage community members to support these initiatives is, a, is an important question for both of you. But again, let's start with Janet and, and Vimp. Sure, thanks. Great question. We were very fortunate to launch our program through the membership and the Cham Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. So we had a full buy-in and support, of course, of our, our board of directors and the chamber itself. And our chamber is um, the, the second largest chamber in Atlantic Canada, next to Halifax. So we have a we had a, a really good pool of of a mentor um, candidates and. Again, it's best practice, and, and what we were looking for were people who um, had a real showed a real genuine interest in in supporting the newcomer community. People that had um, professional experiences with the key components of starting a business, such as the law and, and uh, banking, Canadian banking practice and accounting, because we, we call the, uh, the, the legal aspect, the accounting, and the banking um, the big three. Those are the big three. The, 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 the cultural learning, business learning of doing business in Canada revolves around those three professional activities. So we were really looking for uh, folks that were in that space. And honestly, when we started the program, we really didn't have um, uh, any difficulty in finding members of the community that were very excited about this because we were launching something new. What, what quickly happened, however, and I, I think that Rain touched on this, the uh, the challenges, the cultural challenges, the uh, the language challenges, and um, our, our, many of our newcomer entrepreneurs not really being sure what they wanted to do. So our mentors really didn't know how to support them uh, in those cases. So uh, then we were challenged to find um, a really solid program to give our mentors were looking for, they were looking for support as well. So a train the trainer program, which really didn't exist back in 2009 that we could find. So um, uh, locating and recruiting mentors was not hard, but keeping them engaged and um, offering them support um, proved to be um, a challenge right up front, front that we recognized. And again, that's why I said as we move forward with the program, we decided it was best practice for us to move into um, a new culture of uh, group mentoring or a speed mentoring for the clients. And then as they advanced in their programs and, and, and actually had a plan in play, then we would identify a one-on-one -on -one, a coach or mentor for them. <laughs> Very good. Um, Reem, do you want to weigh, weigh in on that question about how, how you go about identifying um, individuals within the host community to support um, um, your work with, with newcomers? Yes, I'll, I'll just briefly mention two, two points. Um, the first being the advantage of having the Peterborough Immigration Partnership embedded within the MCC. Um, because that really gives us immediate access to many of the organizations and even the individuals who are very interested in supporting the work that we do. Um, the second piece is around being a small community. And I know that there are perhaps some disadvantages to being a small community, but the real advantage is that you get to know a lot of people very quickly. And so the networking piece becomes um, sort of facilitated by us uh, once a client approaches us for, uh, for example, whether it's business uh, development or career counseling or employment counseling. And so finding the support is, I'm not going to say is easy, but it's uh, facilitated because career counseling or employment counseling. And so finding the support is, I'm not going to say is easy, but it's uh, facilitated because of access to um, the great partners that we have in our community. So um, for us then it becomes a matter of um, knowing who to engage and who to um, attract um, within a certain um, 
within a certain topic um, uh, around employment. Um, just knowing who to approach, and sometimes it's just a one-on-one -on -one connection that we make between a single individual client and a business owner. Um, mm -hmm. Or in the case of the Newcomer Kitchen, for example, um, or even its sister project here at the NCC, the Sewing Collective, um, it's about bringing that collective of women in touch with um, women entrepreneurs in our community or other local businesses who want to have that social value added to the work that they do. Huh. That's great. I'm just going to quick question on this, uh, knowing how to engage, because it's, it is such an important issue. And it, um, in, uh, I'm, I'm always interested, how important has city leadership been to the success of your initiatives um, in smaller communities? Just a quick answer from you, Reem, and then we'll move, ask you about the, uh, what, your ability to get city leaders on board, municipal leaders specifically. Um, the city is represented on the coordinating committee of the Peterborough Immigration Partnership. And the partnership um, coordinating committee meets uh, once a month um, just to go over updates of the work that has been um, that's being done within the social and economic integration work plan um, at the NCC as well as part of PIP. Um, and then they engage uh, with the work um, in a way that they see that they can contribute to. Um, in addition to the city, we have the Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, well, good connections with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, like I said, the Peterborough and Cortha's economic development. So we have multiple big actors, big leaders in the community that are present with us through the Peterborough Immigration Partnership, and as such are connected with the work that we do at the new Canadian Center. Oh, that's great. And just quickly to you, Janet, um, how about lead, uh, city leadership, uh, specifically in the mayor's office, how important has that been to the success of the Penn Ignite? Absolutely. We have a, we have a wonderful mayor, um, Mayor Mike O'Brien here in Fredericton, very engaged, very involved. He himself um, is meeting on a regular, almost daily basis with uh, exploratory visitors coming into the city if they go into City Hall and he's free. He, he makes the time to uh, to meet with them, and likewise, he ha he attends many of our events. Um, he is, has been truly a, a champion for us, and and our chair for the local immigration partnership is also a city councillor representing uh, the city. So we certainly are, are are well embedded in into the culture of the the city hall here in Frederick. Great. Yes. Great. Great. Okay, I've got a question here from Jahudi Singh, um, it, who wants to know how, uh, how would you suggest determining uh, whether someone is able to start their business without charging a fee for the service? Um, no. Uh, so maybe um, an interesting question. So, at what point do you make that decision, or 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 at what point is it um, in the interests of the client and maybe also the city to to uh, to make the service available. Uh, do you want to start with that one, Reem? Um, well, for for us, the services that we provide are for free. Um, the work that we did uh, with the Newcomer Kitchen project uh, was also available to the clients for free. It was a pilot um, training project. Mm -hmm. um, they did receive some stipends through the Nourish project at a certain point um, in their training. Um, but um, key to our programming is providing these services for free. Um, as long as they're able to commit to actually staying with the training program, which is why we focus so much on um, achieving that commitment and communicating it very well with the women um, as part of the Newcomer's Kitchen project um, early on because mm -hmm. um, we wanted to make sure that they were invested um, and invested in what they wanted to do, um, which wasn't the business. Uh, at the beginning, wasn't the business model. It, it was just training, and as mm -hmm. they developed some skills, they wanted more training and more training until they were ready to commit to a business. So, laying out all the expectations, explaining to them what is going to be required, what the schedule is going to look like, what responsibilities they would have to commit to, that was very important. And it wasn't until then that we really felt they were ready to um, go ahead and launch as a business. Uh. 
That's interesting. And so let's move to you, uh, Janet, with a much more fully articulated um, program. But at what point did you make that decision about introducing a C, and how do you understand that threshold for who can support paying a fee and who can? Right. Oh. So uh, just keeping in mind that our programs were designed for the provincial nominee program for the entrepreneurial stream. Mm -hmm. So these are, are wealthy investors that are coming into the province um, taking advantage of a five-month course, and that would be equal to a certification program, uh, you know, at a local college or university. So, and you know, we were providing them with, um, and we still do. I mean, with with the support and and uh, free services um, for you know one-on-one -on -one meetings with professional um, people, so with lawyers and accountants. So there. You know, that's one thing. But also, if you put a fee on something, then there is a little more, there's a feeling that, you know, it's tangible. If you give everything for, for free, then there's a feeling, well, I, maybe I don't need to attend, or, you know, it's you know it's not necessary that I attend. And we, we take this very seriously. So the people that are participating and giving us their support with free service services and time, that we don't end up with a room with two or three people in it because there's no value, perhaps, mm -hmm. added to it. So, and as I said earlier, um, I'll, I'll just backtrack. If we had somebody come to us and say, you know, like, like I, I'm here, um, I'm not under the entrepreneurial stream, I would really like to do this, we don't turn anybody away. And we will, you know, we have given our services uh, at no cost under certain uh, special circumstances. But I think everybody has to be responsible for the fact that they're coming here to be successful. Mm -hmm. And if that success, there is some responsibility on both sides. Right. Yeah, good point. Okay. So I've got just a couple more, two more questions. I think that we're going to wrap up. From Deborah Lefebvre, um, she thanks you both for your brilliant presentations. And she'd like to know whether how your help or how you help people outside Canada who want to immigrate to your cities. But I'm, let's abbreviate that. Um, how, are you actively recruiting uh, newcomer entrepreneurs from outside the country, uh, Janet? We haven't been. We um, we don't have the ability to to go out into other countries. However. This is something that we're, we're certainly pushing and advocating for because we feel strongly as a city, if we had the opportunity to work with the, the provincial government um, to have direct attraction, then we would have greater successes because we know better than, than you know, others perhaps, even government, um, our local economy. We're the development arm to the, to the, uh, the region. And um, the other thing is, we do have exploratory visitors coming on a regular basis, and we have up to 200 uh, per year coming in to visit the, the regions in, in Fredericton, and we do our best to lay out the red carpet and give them as much information during that uh, visit as possible. And then we, we, we keep a, a database, and uh, we, we hope to uh, keep in touch with those folks and to be able to offer them pre-arrival support and, and information. And the province of New Brunswick did pilot uh, a pre-arrival um, uh, online webinar uh, opportunity to pre-arrivals last year. So, you know, there's there 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 are ways and means to connect with folks before they arrive. And I certainly have seen that those that do connect with us are more prepared to hit the ground running once they arrive. They've gotten that preliminary. Um, base work in play, and they, and they have a, a better understanding of where they need to go. Okay. That's great. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity just to, to wrap up uh, with a few uh, just questions. Um, for example, we've got uh, Daniel uh, Vadnes, who, um, who says, for other regions to better understand how you have developed uh, on the ground, with the Hive and Succession Connect, would you consider hosting, even at a cost, individuals for a few days or a week to learn from you on the spot? I'm not going to make you answer that question right away, Janet, but uh, you can tell there is real appetite here for learning from your experiences. I've also got Jennifer Nickerson asking whether she can get a copy of the guide, and I think we will be making all of that material available um, in, the, in our follow-up email to you all. Um, and um, well, there was one more uh, question, that, an important question. I don't know whether we have time for this. This is from 
Jahodi Singh again, who really is interested in the whole question of assessment and evaluation. Um, how do you how do we understand how these things are working? Um, and she wants to know whether you either of you can share some of the tools that you may have used uh, during your projects. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time, um, and we're going to have to pause um, there. But uh, I, I want to thank you all for, for joining us uh, um, and helping us explore this very rich um, set of ideas. At the end of our, our, our Q&A, I always like to close by asking our presenters a, a very short question. Um, you know, being entrepreneurial is as much an attitude as it is a, as a profession, is, is what we're learning. Uh, what is your experience?